of your lunch, okay? There'll still be enough time for the navigation workshop. All right, so is everybody happy? All right, what we're going to talk about is maritime safety law. And uh, this actually should, should, uh, should go rather quickly in any event. Um, so what is, the, what is sort of the question or the takeaway, the main thing that you want to know for the exam? The major part of maritime safety law in the contemporary era, that is today or after 9-11, is the ISPIS code, the International Ship and Port Facility Security Code, ISPS code. So you want to sort of focus mainly on that, although we'll provide context for how we got to the ISPIS code. The ISPIS code is part of the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, which is the primary instrument for maritime safety globally. So we know that international shipping is a dangerous uh, activity, and it's one of the most uh, high-risk uh, employment options. Uh, going to sea is, is quite risky. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, mishaps that can occur. You can fall down ladders, you can fall overboard, you can become electrocuted. There's uh, very harsh chemicals. This is why there's an entire body of law of maritime law or admiralty law is because there's liability and risk at sea and seafarers are injured. This is why there's also the International uh, Labor Organization has, has a number of treaties for protection of seafarers. It's a high risk activity, yet it's essential for global trade, for, glo for the global economy. More than 90% of international trade goes by sea, and so it's an essential activity, but it's, but it's also high risk. The idea of maritime safety law is to reduce that risk or manage that risk. And we do so principally through flag state jurisdiction. We already talked about exclusive flag state jurisdiction under Article 92 of UNCLOS. And we put exclusive in quotation marks because even though it's theoretically exclusive, there are, especially in the modern day, uh, there are other, other players or other actors that have encroached upon exclusive flag state jurisdiction as a means to sort of manage what's going on at sea. Part of the reason that coastal states and especially port states now have jurisdiction over vessels is because flag states have not always fulfilled their duties in, in, the, in the best way uh, that they possibly could. In particular, there's a phenomenon of open registries or flags of convenience that have had sort of lax standards as flag states, and that has encouraged port states and coastal states to be more proactive and to chip away at the authority of exclusive flag state jurisdiction. The rights of the flag states include the, all states have the right to to have vessels that fly their flag and register those vessels and to maintain exclusive authority over those vessels. But, but flag states also have duties. They have the duty to implement internationally accepted standards, such as the Safety of Life at Sea Convention or the Law of the Sea Convention. These conventions, as well as there's about 150 codes and guidelines, are produced by the, international, the member states of the International Maritime Organization. So that means that the IMO does not produce the guideline. The IMO is a specialized agency of the United Nations. The IMO has a secretariat, which is very helpful and knowledgeable, but and it has about 300 people that work for it. But the IMO itself doesn't produce these guidelines. These guidelines are produced by the member states of the IMO. They use the IMO as a venue. And so when the Law of the Sea Convention refers to the competent international organization, generally it's the IMO. And it requires states to take account of or give effect to, the flag states have to take account of or give effect to these instruments or treaties and guidelines that are produced at the IMO. In international law, when we say instruments, it can be a treaty which is binding, or it could be a non-binding guideline or some sort of protocol that's not legally binding, but nonetheless provides guidance or recommendations 
to states. In this case, it's principally the flag states. Has anybody been to the IMO? It's located on the River Thames in London across from Parliament. The IMO has less of the sort of political gamesmanship that you see in some other international organizations. I may have mentioned that in the Territorial Sea Lecture, and that's because it is not funded in, in the typical way of United Nations agencies. Typical UN agencies, including the UN General Assembly, the, the funding is based upon mostly on the size of the economy of member states, although that's not entirely true. So for example, the United States has the largest economy in the world, and it pays uh, on the order of about 22% of the UN budget. Japan pays the second largest uh, uh, assessment for the United Nations, and it goes on down the line. That's not entirely true, though, because, for example, China now has the second largest economy, but it doesn't pay the second largest amount. My view is that this sort of funding mechanism, although it has some equity uh, features to it, um, what it tends to do is it, is it provides, it sort of licenses uh, states that don't have a stake in the organization. They haven't really paid financially, but they can use the organization for more political uh, purposes. The IMO doesn't suffer from that because the funding is based upon the size of the flag registry. So which countries in the world register the largest number of commercial ships? <laughs> Liberia and Panama. So Liberia and Panama are responsible for about 40 or 45 percent of the IMO budget. What this means is that when they control the budget, it's very much of a, of a workplace activity. It's a technical organization rather than a political organization. So the United States contribution to the IMO or Japan's contribution is actually quite negligent. Uh, and so the flag state administrations, such as a country like Greece, that has a much larger flag registry than most, uh, most countries in the world, are paying the bills. And so they require that this organization produce tangible results for maritime safety, security, and environmentally sound shipping. Really, the inception for all of the global law of maritime safety can be traced back to the Titanic. When was the Titanic disaster? 1912. 1912. 1912. That's right. And hundreds of lives uh, were lost at this. And as a result, uh, there were inquiries afterwards. Why were so many lives lost? One of the reasons, uh, you've already seen the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, there weren't enough lifeboats. Uh, the, the, one of the other reasons is that vessels that were in the area did not have to maintain radio communications at all times. And so these were two of the biggest uh, uh, findings that were the result of the commissions that, uh, that looked into this. And these, uh, these issues were incorporated then into international standards. And there was also establishment of the International Ice Patrol. So the, the original Safety of Life at Sea Convention came out of the Titanic disaster. And the goal is to eliminate what are called substandard ships, or ships that do not meet internationally accepted standards. Of course, like all laws, this is an aspirational goal. Of course, there are substandard ships that exist, but the goal is to uh, reduce and then hopefully eliminate. Probably will never eliminate but at least reduce them. The principal instrument for doing so is the Safety of Life at Sea Convention. The 1974 SOLAS Convention focuses on all areas of safety at sea, including special regulations or codes for specific purposes, such as carriage of uh, dangerous goods or for oil tankers. Also, there are other bulk product tankers, such as um, food oil tankers, such as uh, seed oil tankers, and all of these have different standards for safety. The thing about the IMO that makes it probably unique in international law and treaties, uh, I mean, the, with, with regard to the Solis Convention, is that the IMO can adopt, through this tacit acceptance procedure, amendments of treaties that are adopted at IMO. 
So the Safety of Life at Sea Convention is one of the principal IMO treaties, and if you want to amend that, the normal process for amending the treaty is that you go back to the states that are party to it, and each state has to validate that they would accept the amendment. And it's a very time-consuming process with 150 or 160 states' parties, it would be very challenging to amend, to formally amend the treaty. What the IMO has said is that all of the treaties of the IMO can be amended through a tacit acceptance process. And this means that uh, it, it's just amended through a voice vote by consensus in the Maritime Safety Committee, and then that is adopted by the IMO assembly formally. So it's a very flexible mechanism to be able to sort of amend treaties on the fly or as you go. And as a result, the Safety of Life at Sea Convention has probably about 50 amendments uh, through the years, and uh, you know some are more significant, some, some less significant. What we'll talk about is one of the most, probably the most significant, which is the ISPIS code. And even the ISPIS code, by the way, can be amended through this tacit procedure. So you just can add regulations onto the Safety of Life at Sea Convention through this consensus oral or voice vote process. And once that occurs, all the countries that have joined the Safety of Life at Sea Convention then commit to incorporate that into their domestic implementation. The ISPIS code has two parts a mandatory part and a recommendatory part. Before we get to the ISPIS code, which is a result of the attacks of 9-11, let's talk about the, the, uh, the, the principal mechanism for maritime safety that predated that. The ISM code, the International Safety Management Code, was uh, developed in 1994. It entered into force in 1998. And what it requires is that flag states issue certifications in certain areas to certify or render proof that vessels that fly their flag uh, meet certain standards. The most important ones are standards for the environment, for ship operations, for authority on board the ship, which generally means that vessels have to have a clear line of authority or a clear a chain of command in which the master of the vessel or the captain of the vessel is the ultimate authority on board the ship and that that authority can be delegated downward to other officers and to crew members. There has to be also a system in place to report incidents such as accidents or what are called non-conforming anomalies which means things like near misses, things that you don't like, that you don't want to happen. Uh, so non-conforming anomalies also have to be reported. And then there has to be a system for auditing to make sure that the vessel has all of the standards and certifications that are in place. Of course, vessels know and understand this, and so sometimes they will do what's called gun decking, which is that they will uh, they, they will pretend like they have all the training, they'll just mark it off without actually having done it. So this is something that, that uh, enforcement authorities look out for. Coast guards and port, port security officials look out for in reviewing whether ships are compliant with the Safety of Life at Sea Convention and the, uh, the ISM Code. The ISM Code is incorporated into the Safety of Life at Sea Convention just like the ISM Code. Another feature of the Safety of Life at Sea Convention is it requires a ship security alert system, which means that every ship must have a security alert system that alerts shore facilities if there is an incident, such as an emergency or an attack by pirates. The ship security alert system, SSAS, has to be, uh, be you have to be able to, to trigger it from the, from the, uh, uh, from the bridge of the ship, as well as one other location on the ship, some other secret location that crew members know about. And then this is silent on the ship. It does not send an alarm throughout the ship, but it just notifies 
is the, uh, the, the authorities on the shore that some sort of incident has taken place. Now let's get to the ISCUS code. This is what you'll want to know for the exam. You'll want to be able to describe the ISCUS code. The ISCUS code came about after the attacks of 9-11 in order to harden all of the ship and port facilities to, uh, to, that are involved in global trade. Because the worry was that the attacks of 9-11 just presaged other attacks which will take place, take place against this global infrastructure. Because one of the goals of Al-Qaeda was to, to, they wanted to destroy or to hamper the global economy. And not just the United States, but the entire world. And one of the vectors for the global economy, of course, is the, uh, is the international shipping. So it has two parts in chapter 11. Chapter 11 has special measures for maritime safety, including AIS and ship identification numbers to make it more difficult for ships to be misused or for, to put ships at risk. We'll talk about uh, just a little about that. But first, we'll talk about maritime security. Maritime security is in the International Ship and Port Facility Security Code, the ISPIS Code. So the idea is that you want to have this entire global cargo chain, cargo chain security uh, in place so that there's no weak points beginning from the consigner, putting it on the road or rail, taking it through customs, putting it into the terminal, in the port facility, uh, having the, uh, the handling agent, loading it on the ship and carrying it. Then the ship goes to another country, arrives in port, and goes through the reverse process all the way to the consigner that takes it to the Walmart near you. Okay? And so the idea of the ISPIS code is to ensure that there is some security standards throughout this entire global cargo, cargo chain security so that you can get your flat screen TV made in China or now Malaysia. So the ISPIS code involves a partnership between the public sector and the private sector because most of these facilities in almost every country are owned by private companies. And they may not, they, the company may actually uh, be registered in a third state. So for example, in the United States, we have port facilities that might be owned by a company in Dubai. Global, uh, Dubai World Ports, for example, operates some of the major US ports. So you want to be able to form a partnership between the governments, the public sector, and these corporations involving ship to shore. There's two really principal uh, fulcrums. The first is that there has to be threat assessments conducted by each of these ships and ports that are involved in global cargo chain security. And there has to be security plans in place to be able to deter those threats. <coughs> part A and Part B, mandatory and guidelines. We'll talk mainly about the mandatory. The guidelines are, are in much greater detail. So this is really the architect <coughs> for cargo chain security. Governments set threat levels, and the governments are rep represented through a designated authority. Whoever's in charge of ports, like in the US, it might be the US Maritime Administration, uh, could be the Coast Guard. And then for ships, it's the flag state administration. Again, the, the US is the US Maritime Administration. It is the flag state authority of the government. It sets the security levels, normal, heightened, or there's some sort of imminent threat. Based upon that security level, then uh, ships have to conduct a security assessment. They have to develop a security plan. And they have to designate security officers and assistant security officers. And on the port side, it's the same thing. They have to have port security officers, port security assessments, port security plans. There has to be company security officers. If, so if the company owns a fleet of ships, then all of the, the, the ships and port 
the ship security officers report to the company security officer to maintain sort of a, a hierarchy. The Flag State Administration then reviews all of this security architecture for the ships or the ports, and it certifies that they meet certain standards. So what would be standards? It would be things like a ship security officer would have to have certain levels of training, maybe even training in the use of force or training in what to do. Okay, if there's a piracy attack and you know that your ship is under attack by piracy, does the ship security officer know what to do? Yes, I know I need to, uh, to initiate the ship, ship security alert system. I need to um, begin evasive maneuvers of the vessel in uh, zigzag maneuvers. Uh, I have to obviously report it to the master of the ship. I have to alert the crew. I have to whatever, you, whatever else, you know, hide the gold in the safe. All of the steps that have to be taken in order to protect the ship against piracy if it's under attack. What if you're not under attack, but you're just in an area that's a high risk area for piracy attack? Well, what, is this, what, what would have to be involved in the ship security plan? Well, I might have to increase the speed of the vessel to make it more difficult to board the ship. Uh, I might have to uh, extend concertina wire around the, around the lifelines of the vessels. So th there are all of these, uh, all of these measures that would have to be put in place for certain, uh, uh, for certain situations. And they would be included in the ship's, ship security plan. And then that is reviewed by the administration, by the government. And the government then, once it's satisfied, uh, issues a certificate. Also, when a ship enters into a port, the ship and the port have to exchange declarations of security. This is an agreement of interaction to ensure that they both have the same level of security so that there's no weak point. So for example, if you're going through an airport security and you want to get on the airplane, there's no exception if you want to bring your you know, two liter bottle of Coca-Cola, which is kind of disgusting, but nonetheless, if you, if you wanted a two liter bottle of Coke, they wouldn't let just one person on the airplane because that would be that would be a, a point of weakness because the Coca-Cola might be whatever the liquid bomb is we're afraid of. It's the same with a ship going into a port. They wouldn't let a ship into a port that has a certain level of security unless the ship also has that same level of security. Otherwise, that would be a point of weakness for that port. So the port would insist that that ship uh, rise to that same level or have that same level of security. The same thing occurs if a ship is going to interact with another ship at sea, such as bunkering, you're going to buy fuel from a ship. You want to make sure that both ships have the same level of security. So in this way, the idea is to inoculate the entire global cargo, cargo chain security so that there's no point, single point of weakness or single point of failure. Let's look at port state control. So there's, there's, ship, there's ship security and port security, and both of them are, are essential. The idea of port state control is that flag states have been lax in ensuring uh, security on board their vessels because of open registries or flags of convenience. So about two or three decades ago, port states got together and they said, we understand that there is exclusive flag state jurisdiction over ships. We also understand that as coastal states, we have very limited authority to interfere with or inspect a ship that's in the exclusive economic zone. Even in the territorial sea, there's rather limited coastal state authority. But ports are different because the port is within the the sovereignty, the territory of the state, and ports have 
virtually absolute authority to restrict vessels that come into their port. So ports got together and they said, let's agree to have very strict standards in our ports. And by doing so, we can sort of in a, in a back doorway compel ships to meet those standards. Because if you want to go into some of the major ports in the world, such as Shanghai or Tokyo, you have to meet the standards of those ports. And the port states have absolute authority to, uh, to, to require that. Now, it doesn't work very well if just one port in a region has very strict standards. Because what would happen is, if say if Shanghai has very strict standards, there might be lax standards in a port in Vietnam. So the countries got together and said, let's create regional agreements where there's no single port that might be below standards that would attract all the substandard ships. If all the ports have a very high standard, then there's nowhere for ships to go. They can't offload in a, in a low standard port. So we'll assign, the, we'll assign these memorandums of agreement, these treaties, that require certain standards. So how do they know whether vessels that come into the port meet certain standards? Each of these regional MOUs require that every port within that region conduct certain ins inspections on board ships. Now you can't, you can't inspect every ship for every international standard because the IMO has about 50 treaties and then there's about 150 codes and guidelines. So commerce has to, has to be, be able to, uh, to be facilitated. You have to have commerce and you can't inspect every ship. But what the MOUs say is that we will inspect a certain percentage of the ships. We commit that we'll inspect, say, 20% or 25% of the ships. And that we'll board and conduct a thorough inspection, inspection of maybe 5% of the ships. So in this way, the, the commerce continues to flow, but there are spot checks. And then they also agree that if a flag registry has had consistent levels of failure, that then those registries are going to have heightened uh, inspections when they come into the port. So if you have, uh, let's just pick on the United States, say the United States has lax standards. Uh, and so it has consistently failed a number of inspections. Then the Asia Tokyo MOU, what they would say is, okay, we're gonna be on the lookout for US flag vessels. And if a US flag vessel comes in, we're going to conduct a more thorough inspection. And all of the ports in this region agree that we're going to do that in order to incentivize that flag administration and that flag registry to make sure that it fulfills its obligations of international standards. These are the, uh, the list of active uh, port state control MOUs. Another, another major feature of maritime safety law is the collision regulations. The collision regulations will focus on two of the four parts. The first thing to know about the collision regulations is that it applies to all ships, meaning it applies to commercial vessels as well as government vessels. There is no sovereign immunity for the collision regulations rules. There might be sovereign immunity for enforcement, but not for prescription, not for prescribing the rules. What do the collision regulations require? Well, you can look at the rules if you want. You can find them, find them on the internet. Uh, rules six, seven, and eight are particularly important. All they require is that, uh, is that vessels uh, provide, uh, vessels implement good practice to give way to vessels that are uh, in accordance with the rules of the road. They have to uh, conduct their, their, their operations in certain ways, such as if there's limited visibility, you have to reduce speed, uh, you have to take action to avoid collision. You can't just um, uh, rely on the other party, the other vessel, to avoid a collision. All vessels have the obligation to take steps to avoid collision. 
Um, you have to render due regard for vessels. You have to follow, there's international rules of the road of which type of vessel has to give way. So if you're ever hiking on a hiking path and you see like a picture of a horse or a bicycle uh, or pedestrians, people walking, you know that, uh, that uh, the bicycle has to give way to the person. And then who has to give way between the person and the horse? The person has to give way to the person to the to the people on horseback. The horse has the right of way because they can be spooked and that sort of thing. So it's the same thing with types of vessels, where a motorized vessel has to give way to a sailing vessel because the sailing vessel has less maneuverability. It's those sorts of uh, rules. And then there are uh, Part C and D rules for lights and, and sound signals, uh, how how to signal distress and that sort of thing. So collision regulations are a fundamental feature of safety of life at sea. Another provision in safety of life at sea is the AIS system. Is everybody familiar with automatic identification system? It's a VHF system, and it uh, generally uh, goes by line of sight, which means that it travels farther the higher up you are. And what it does is it provides certain data. It broadcasts certain data over a VHF band, including the name of the vessel, the flag registry, the, uh, the course, and the speed of the vessel. And so you can see, remember I had the other day, I had the map of Singapore. Those were all AIS hits for vessels out in, uh, in Singapore's territorial sea and outside of the port of Singapore. And that's what it looks like um, as a graphic image. And you'll be able to scroll over it, and you can see certain data that are, uh, that are about that vessel. So it gives you a, an automatic or a digitized picture of what's going on in the marine environment. There's also some debate, since we live in kind of a cyber world now, about whether this information ought to be available on the internet. Some people think that, yes, it should, and you can actually subscribe to systems and find all this data on the internet. Other people are worried that bad actors might use this information to target vessels. Uh, you can make arguments both ways. AIS is extremely helpful, but it has limitations. The major limitation is that it is VHF, which at sea level travels about 20 or 30 miles. Uh, if you have an airplane that is equipped with AIS, you can, it can, might, might go out as far as, say, 300 miles. But it's limited by the signal. So what states have done is they went to the IMO and they, they adopted LRIT, Long Range Identification and Tracking, which is a satellite-based system, which is now entering into service. And it has global coverage. Ships routing is also developed through the IMO. And it is uh, promulgated by the general provision on ships routing in which ships uh, are, are either required or recommended to take certain routing measures beyond the territorial sea. So this is, this is if you want to have routes for ships that are prescribed, such as in an environmentally sensitive area, but it's beyond the territorial sea. The coastal state cannot do that unilaterally. So the coastal state would go to the IMO with a proposal to have a certain routing of ships uh, to, to, you know, for whatever reason, primarily for environmental purposes or to avoid hazardous uh, features such as uh, reefs or whatever. And you take the proposal to the IMO and then the IMO can either adopt it as mandatory or recommendatory. If it's a recommendatory proposal, it might be something like recommending that ships take on board local pilots to get through a, uh, a particular area, such as the Torres Strait between Australia and Papua New Guinea. There's a variety of forms that ship routing can take, including traffic separation schemes, traffic lanes, roundabout. You know, a roundabout is just like a rotary on the road, which is um, uh, in constricted or confined waters, or you could have precautionary areas or areas to be avoided. 
And areas to be avoided could be recommendatory or they could be mandatory. And they might only be during certain times of the year, such as is it, if this is a location in which there are marine mammals or seals that use it as a rookery to, uh, to reproduce. Uh, or if whales are in the area during a certain year, you might have it as an area to be avoided. All ships, all international seagoing ships above, uh, above 3,000 tons have a voyage deck report, just like they have on board aircraft, so that if there is some sort of casualty or some sort of incident, there's a record, a digital record preserved, and investigators can find out why. The load lines convention is, is uh, kind of interesting because it requires the markings that you see on board large vessels. And why is the markings, how could the markings be a safety feature? The marking you can see as you go back to Dave, you can look at the load lines on board this uh, 3,000 ton ship that's, uh, that's tied up over here. But what is it, the Dong Back? Dong Back, or I, I think the name. The, the vessel. Yeah, um, you can see. But when you go back today, look at the load lines. Why do they have different lines? They have different lines because buoyancy is a safety factor. You don't want to have, you want to maintain positive buoyancy. If you have negative buoyancy, it means you're underwater, which is not a good thing. Positive buoyancy uh, is important to maintain the stability of the ship so that if the ship takes rolls, during waves, it will, mean, it, will, it will continue upright. You can have negative buoyancy in areas like the Arctic Ocean, where, you, uh, where ice builds up on the, on the superstructure of the ship, and it becomes heavier. It's called rime ice, R-I-M-E. And rime ice is formed by ice, that's, uh, by moisture that's in the air, like fog, that collects on board the ship, and it makes the vessel heavier. That's why in the, when, when ships go in the Arctic, the crew have baseball bats. It's not because they play baseball on board the ship, but they actually beat the, beat the uh, ice off the ship and kick the ice off the ship to maintain positive buoyancy because if the ice builds up and the vessel is less stable. Load lines are on the ship and there's not one single line because vessel buoyancy is affected by the type of water. So fresh water and salt water affects the buoyancy of a vessel, as well as temperatures affect the buoyancy of a vessel. So tropical waters have different buoyancy than Arctic waters. And so the vessel can be loaded to different levels of cargo and fuel based upon the environment that it's going to operate in. There's also the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping of Seafarers. So this is just the, remember back in Article 94, flag state responsibilities are to ensure that the crew members and the, and the master on board the ship are compliant with international standards. This sets the standards for the crew and the master, all of the things that they have to be proficient in in their profession. Finally, there's the Polar Code, which is sort of the most recent uh, iteration of IMO instruments for safety. What it does is it provides special standards that apply in Arctic and Antarctic waters. It also maintains special search and rescue areas in the uh, Arctic Ocean. There are certain standards for uh, ice breaking, for communications in the Arctic, because they're, because communications and especially satellites operate differently in the Arctic, there, there's, a, there's more difficulty in maintaining a signal. Also, there are different standards with regard to uh, uh, life boats, for example, that have to be covered in the Arctic and have to have uh, certain supplies in order to maintain uh, any sort of hope that, that, that the seafarers would be able to uh, survive. And then finally, I'll end with this, and then we'll, we'll uh, break for lunch. Finally, there's the, uh, the, the SAR Convention, the Search and Rescue Convention, which divides up the world into 13 search and rescue areas. And these 13 search and rescue areas are operated by specific states that have 
search and rescue authority or primary authority to maintain search and rescue uh, in, in these areas. And that's all I have. We have uh, so we're only actually we're only five minutes late. This is a this was a fairly short module. So what we'll do is we'll come back from lunch five minutes late. I think we come back at 14:05 instead of. Is that right? Uh, it's up to our staff members, but I saw the sign for is 2:30. Oh, 2:30. Is it 2:30? Well, I'm not sure about that. The day, the day, all right, hold on just a second. So the the schedule here says that we come back at. Uh, Two o'clock. So let's come back. Let's just say ten after. We'll give you a little extra time. Come back. Come back at uh, ten after two. Okay. All right. Rather than they don't have. 